Do you feel that uh, sometimes in your life is art was a kind of burden to you and how it changed your life because it it clearly changed your life? T totally. You know, luckily I have piano which keeps me stable. I am still I am still working for yeah. Henry and Nathan now today, you know, I'm working for Henry interview for you, but it's my work of life. My name is Philippe Cohen Solal, and you're listening to the second episode of Outsider, the amazing story of Henry Dogger. Today, thanks to Kyoko and Nathan Lerner, Henry Dogger's work is known and exhibited around the world. One can even visit his room, not at 851 Webster Avenue, where he used to live, but at Intuit, a museum dedicated to outsider art in Chicago. The CEO of Intuit is another dogger enthusiast, Debra Carr. I'm Debra Carr. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art in Chicago. I've been the CEO for six years, and I came on board to really help transform the museum and make it more well-known internationally. Debra Carr certainly succeeded in her mission. Intuit is recognized today as one of the major institutions dedicated to outsider art. The museum's first purpose was really to gain more recognition and awareness of this underappreciated genre. And now we fast forward to 2021. The genre is much more robust. People are looking for it, collecting it. Major museums are exhibiting this art. And our mission has, has adjusted a bit to this new appreciation so that now we are focused on continuing to gain more audiences and reveal new and underappreciated artists to audiences that fall in love with this particular kind of self-taught art. How would you, would you define uh, outsider art? There's no set definition for outsider art, but we like to say that it's art made by people who didn't come to art making through a traditional route, that oftentimes they are so compelled to make art that they must make art even if they don't have uh, training or resources. And oftentimes these are people who make art with whatever is to hand, so found materials and objects used to make art. A lot of these artists have faced some kind of barrier, not all of them, but many of them. It could be poverty, um, post-traumatic stress, some sort of um, mental or physical difference. And art making is a way of gaining empowerment, self-fulfillment, um, oftentimes prisoners, uh, people who've been in confinement or institutionalized make this art. And I, I think that that is a way for them to express their voice in a way that they're um, not otherwise allowed to do. The label outsider art was partly inspired by the French term of art brut, which translates to raw art. It was coined in 1945 by French artist Jean Dubuffet. It's interesting because uh, Intuit is in Chicago because there's a lot of people in Chicago who really love this art. And in 1951, Jean Dubuffet came to the Arts Club of Chicago and gave a speech called um, Anti-Cultural Positions. So there's very much a, a close link between uh, our brute and um, Intuit and the Chicago outsider art scene. Um, the, the Jean Dubuffet's original definition of art brute was more focused on, on people with um, mental differences. And I think that today um, that term has, has broadened in Europe to include um, a, a whole host of, of artists with differences or who have come to the art untrained. But I think that the 
Um, the term outsider art is probably considered to be a slightly more encompassing term, but I think today, I think that we can almost use them interchangeably. I was curious to ask Debra Carr if she actually used the term outsider, since the label has received some criticism over the years. The term outsider, I think some people interpret that to mean that we're placing these artists on the outside. Um, and so it can be a, a controversial term if, if, if it's applied. And I think that there are, of course, a lot of artists that just want to be recognized as artists. They don't want to be categorized as female or black or um, you know, pigeonholed in some way. So I think it's understandable that artists want to avoid labels. But I think that at the same time, if, if we can't call it something, we can't um, raise it up as something that's very unique and special and worth consideration. So we still use the term, but I like to say that this is not about pushing someone to the outside. It's about people who are making art outside of the mainstream classical art tradition. So not the Eurocentric white male mainstream, but a genre that recognizes and puts a spotlight on artists who come from non-traditional backgrounds. I like to think of Intuit as a great entry point for people maybe who have never visited an art museum before. It's very obvious when school children come in the door and we, in normal times, we've hosted lots of school groups and they see the artworks and maybe they see some works by uh, Chicago artist, Mr. Imagination, who incorporates bottle caps, paint brushes, uh, toothbrushes, bowling pins, and the children come into the museum And, and I can hear these cries of, ooh, and oh, look at that, because the, the work is made from familiar materials and familiar objects. You know, it's a, it's a very different, a very um, visceral approach to art, because the themes, themes like poverty and abuse, prejudice, violence, Roy Ferdinand comes to mind. He's a, he was a New Orleans-based artist, and lots of themes of violence and characters carrying guns. You can have a very visceral reaction to that and understand the motivation for that artwork very easily because it is raw art. It is our brute. Which brings to Henry Dogger now. <laughs> yes. Would you say that a lot of people come to Intuit to see Henry Dagger's room? And how famous would you say Dagger is for the general public? Well, I think that it's interesting. Um, oftentimes we have people that come to the museum who've never heard of Henry Dagger. But of course, we get people who come to the museum from all over the world to see our recreation of Henry Dagger's room with, with the actual objects that he lived with and worked with. And... He is, for many people, the gateway to outsider art because people discover him. Either either they were they saw a play about him or a television show or a documentary or listened to your, your music, Philippe, or um, the Vivian Girls Band. So there's been so much pop culture created around the mystery of Henry Darger. And when people learn about him, they then become um, completely drawn in by... Uh, both the the art and the mystery around him. And of course, I shouldn't leave out his writings as well. So he was uh, he was uh, kind of the full package of someone who created a whole world in his mind and then represented that in written word and in his artwork. And people are still uh, learning and trying to fathom um, what he was trying to create with this this magical world, which, Uh, I often liken to, you know, Game of Thrones or the um, Tolkien novels. You cannot pass! Get out! Henry Dagger called his own epic masterpiece In the Realms of the Unreal, a 15,000-page novel which he later adapted in visuals. 
long, narrow, panoramic paintings made from collage, tracing, and watercolor. The main characters of his story are seven little girls. He named the Vivian girls. Seven Vivian girls, princesses, who in an epic good versus evil story are um, amassing armies like Joan of Arc to rescue child slaves who are being held by the evil Glendalinians. And it's this is a 15,000 page story that goes back and forth with all the the sagas of these Vivian girls and their armies trying to rescue the child slaves in a child slave rebellion against the bad guys. Still onward, we'll follow our guide When we shall see him, the king in his beauty Happy, how happy, our place at his side When Kyoko Lerner gave all of Henry's belongings to Intuit in order for them to recreate his room, she also allowed them to save all of his source material and art supplies. I visited the room when it first opened for the public in 2008. I will always remember the feeling of being exactly where the art was made, surrounded by all of Henry's possessions at the heart of his creative process. We tried to emulate the original room as closely as possible. And Philippe, you will have seen the original fireplace, the, the apron, the part of the fireplace that extends out onto the floor is slightly shorter than in real life, but the tiles have been lovingly, you know, replaced and the, the fireplace is there with the mantle and the objects that that Henry had sort of a almost in a in a cabinet of curiosities, almost in a in a three-dimensional collage of objects on the on the mantelpiece of the fireplace. That has all been um, painstakingly recreated. Objects of his that are that were around the room are there. It's not as messy as the Uh, real room was. Henry was a hoarder and had stacks of magazines and newspapers around. So we have it a little bit more um, negotiable so people can see the objects. But we have the, I would say that the crown jewel of the room are these paint pots. So he took the lids, the little metal lids off of bottles and inverted them and mixed up tempera and put little paper labels that he had hand lettered uh, on these paint pots. So he'd mixed colors he wanted. And we think maybe he was experimenting with tempera because it has a more vivid color than traditional watercolors. And he has little labels on them like uh, army shirt green and storm cloud purple. I think those are really magnificent. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about his, his technique, his artistic technique in this process? That's one of the great things about the collection that we have at Intuit. We have um, just uh, piles and piles, boxes and boxes of his source materials. He very um, religiously every day, it seemed, would, would cut out things from magazines or the newspaper or comics. And these were materials he might want to trace. So he taught himself to draw through tracing. And we have lots of tracing paper and things that he traced. Um, we know that he used watercolor. He used found pieces of paper. We, we don't quite know how he did it in his small apartment, but he, he bound all these big, long watercolors into a book that uh, then had them folded in thirds Um, like, a, like a giant fold-out picture book that he made. He also incorporated collage. So he would, he would trace things, but he would also collage in certain elements, which made them quite fantastical. He would um, take some of these um, images that he cut out, and, and he also had these incredible coloring book pages. And we know that he would go to the local drugstore and take some of his meager salary and make photographic Um, enlargements or um, reductions. That would have been very expensive to do back in his day, but um, he used those to make make different sizes of things. So he has some of his pictures. I mean, some of the most fantastical ones have like these giant flowers and the, these children, he would take these coloring book images and use the children over and over again. We have a coloring book page of a little girl in a kitchen making making something, baking, and I call her a little cooking girl, but she appears over and over and over again, sometimes in the same artwork. Um, and she's not always cooking. She can be doing lots of other things and, 
And uh, there's another one I call Little Umbrella Girl, who's got a little raincoat on and carrying an umbrella. She appears over and over again in the artworks. The same with a little um, little Miss Muffet who comes from a nursery rhyme. Um, you know, she's repeated over and over. So, I mean, I think that's part of the charm of the work is these incredible large format paintings and these large panoramas and these repeating child figures. They're, they're really quite uh, spectacular. Well, the first time I saw like Dogger's art at the folk art in New York, I really literally fell in love with his art. And I'm so obsessed almost by his work and I'm, I'm so moved by his work. Um, what do you say is so striking about his paintings? Well, I, I'm obsessed too, Philippe, so I'm right there with you. You know, I discovered him probably around, oh, even later than you did. But um, I have to say that there are certain elements of the artwork um, that really grab you. The interesting sizes of some of the panoramic works. I think the repetition um, is very captivating. I think it's it's almost like, you know, find the hidden object. I was looking at a, at a painting a couple of years ago that was being sold at Christie's. And as you know, Darger has an obsession with hats. So a lot of his um, warriors are wearing different kinds of hats. They could be cowboy hats or mortarboards like you see in graduation ceremonies and, and berets, you know, na top hats and bowlers, a whole, you know, a whole range of different kinds of hats. And I noticed that one of the characters in this painting I was looking at, it was a big battle scene, was wearing what looked to me like an old fashioned football helmet, American football helmet, like made with leather with a little strap under the chin, and like they wore in the old days. And then I got to looking and it appeared to me that some of the, the characters in the painting were carrying bombs. And as I looked at them, I thought, oh no, they're using they're carrying bombs under the crook of their arm in the same exact way American football players would run with a, with a football. And I thought, Oh my goodness, he's traced, he's traced a whole football scene into this painting. So yeah. I think that every painting has, has a mystery, you know, mm -hmm. one of the, one of the ones that we often exhibit it at into it has a, has a battle going on, but right down the middle of the painting, Uh, coming towards you are these railroad tracks and there's a train on the railroad tracks coming right at you while the girls are battling on either side and on top of the railroad tracks yeah. the bad guys who are nearby and I and I love this it's such a dramatic painting um, yeah. but then when you look in the distance on the left side of the railroad tracks off in the distance it looks like it looks like a, a little house on the prairie it looks like a you know western a cabin out on the parade. And if you look off to the right of the painting, it looks like a European town with a castle up on the mountain. I'm like, look at all of this crazy stuff thrown together in the same painting. It's so exciting and so, um, so, so mysterious. It's, you know, er every image has, has so much going on. And the more you look at it, the more you find. We sigh for the child slaves, dread the pains of the new. Their raking sorrows are many, their joys are few. Today, Henry Dogger's artwork is exhibited and celebrated around the world. But when it was first discovered, it received a lot of criticism. From the 70s to the end of the 20th century, Dogger was mostly called crazy, sometimes even a pedophile because of his repetitive drawings of naked little girls tortured by men. Of course, not all the artworks are beautiful, as you well know, Philippe. Some of them are very horrendous and, and scary. I oftentimes have people come in and they might see one of these really scary artworks of the child slaves being tortured by the Glendalinians or the girls naked. And people are saying, what, what is going on here? This is really scary. How could this have come out of someone's imagination? But he had a horrific childhood and he translated that into the story of these evil people and the good people and the heroine girls like Jeanne d'Arc, you know, coming in to, to save the day. For a long time, no one knew about Henry Dogger's deeply traumatic childhood. 
not many people understood that art making was actually a way for him to rewrite his childhood memories. My guests for the next episode of Outsider are Michael Boone Steele and Jimmy Lage. Both are scholars who have researched Henry Darger's life in order to get a better understanding of how trauma shaped his art. Darger wasn't doing any more than, say, a novelist like Stephen King would do when Stephen King would write about monsters. It doesn't really mean that Stephen King was a monster. But because uh, Darger was not understood in any, in any fashion, nobody knew anything about him, they projected their own fears, their own judgments upon him. Even today, there's still a lot of controversy surrounding him. Outsider is a seven-part podcast series. It was created by Philippe Cohen-Solal, written by Clémentine Spiller, and produced by César de Pouilly for Yabasta Records. Special thanks to Jeffrey Carey for reading excerpts from History of My Life by Henry Darger. If you enjoyed the music in this episode, you can listen to The Outsider Album by Philippe Cohen-Solal and Mike Lindsay. The album is inspired by the works of Henry Darger. It's out now and streaming on all platforms. As of all.